Hello everyone, it's Davey Mooney, coming to you from UNT, where I run the jazz guitar program. I'm a Benedetto artist, Sunnyside Records artist, got my Sunnyside uh, discography up here. Live at National Sawdust is the latest, although there's a new one coming out June 9th. Uh, Benign Strangers, Hope of Home, Perrier Street, I've got a couple Mel Bay books, Personalizing Jazz Vocabulary. The latest is Into the Labyrinth, An Anatomy of Position Playing for Jazz Guitar. And uh, we got one more week of uh, winter break before uh, the spring 2023 semester is upon us. Um, I just got back from the Jazz Education Network convention in Orlando. I did a clinic presentation on jazz phrasing. Maybe I'll do a video on that at some point, but I'm sort of trying to formulate another book idea. Now I'm going to have to get another music stand. Um, for these videos, but uh, yeah, that's not what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the tune Invitation. Uh, great jazz standard, one of my faves, um, by, written by Bronislaw Caper. I think I'm saying his name right. It's one of those names that I see written a lot, but I don't really hear people say. Um, I guess there was a film called Invitation. I was looking on Wikipedia uh, from the early 50s. I didn't, I've never seen it. Um, and, you know, Bronislaw, he also wrote Green Dolphin Street on Green Dolphin Street, another famous jazz standard. And so he was a very uh, respected uh, film composer in the sort of golden era of Hollywood. And there's a lot of recordings, jazz recordings of this song. Um, I'm going to talk about a few of them. I guess I first heard it, uh, well, <laughs> got to be honest, y'all, I learned it from the real book, probably, yeah, in in conjunction with just people playing it around at the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts in the 90s. And I used to hear Steve Mazikowski play it a lot at Snug Harbor. And it's on his Live at Snug Harbor album from 1997 that I don't believe is on streaming services. It's not on Apple Music, but I see some of those tunes up on uh, YouTube. And man, it's my, one of my favorite versions of that song. It's Bill Huntington on bass and Johnny Vodakovich on drums. And uh, just the groove of it, everything, the whole... Uh, whole vibe of that recording. It's one of my favorite of Steve's recordings. And uh, it's on John Coltrane's record, Standard Coltrane. It's like late 50s, 58, 57. Joe Henderson, Tetragon, about 10 years later. I wanted to find a vocal version, and there's a bunch of them, but I came across a Rosemary Clooney recording with a Nelson Riddle arrangement, and I just love when I see the Nelson Riddle name, I always want to check out the harmony and check out what he did, because he's one of the great greatest arrangers, if not the greatest, for that style, for those vocal uh, vocalists like Sinatra and Rosemary Clooney and other folks. Um, she does it in E minor, which is kind of interesting because usually it's in uh, C minor. And there isn't as much variation on the harmony uh, on this tune. There's also Bill Evans uh, recording on, uh, is it called Intuition, the duo with Eddie Gomez? Um, and there's a million recordings, I could talk about them all day, but I'll just talk a, a little bit about the few that I mentioned. So most people play it in C minor, other than that vocal, I mean, obviously vocalists do their own thing for the, for the key that's good for them, but the idea is you have this sort of modal this mixture of fairly long stretches on one chord, but also some two fives and some functional harmonies. So you have like C minor, C minor, C minor. C minor. Sometimes you get an F7 before like a B flat 7. Sometimes there'll be some uh, like an F minor before the B flat 7, but most of the versions I was hearing was it's pretty much just a C minor, 2, 2, 3, 4, 3, 2, 3, 4, 4, 2, 3, 4, C minor, 4, 6, 2, 3, 4, and a B flat 7 with at least a sharp 11. Uh, the Nelson Riddle, he's got some crazy chord going on there. I was trying to pick out <laughs> all the notes, but like with the textures, I think it was definitely like a, uh, of course he's in another key, but it was a pretty gnarly, like diminished kind of vibe. There was maybe like a G triad and an E triad on there. A lot of uh, magical notes going on, but <laughs> I remember the Mazikowski and what does he do? He goes. flat 7, and like A flat, E natural, and G, which is kind of cool. And 
and then it goes to E flat minor and kind of does the same thing. So you have about it's almost like an eight, it's eight bars in that C minor key center, but you have like four bars of C minor, six bars of C minor, and then two bars of the B flat seven altered. And maybe you would get an F seven right before the B flat seven, or maybe then F minor. But I think at its most basic, it's six bars of uh, C minor and then two bars of a B flat seven, where the melody is the 13, but then there's usually a sharp 11. Then you get E flat minor and the same kind of melody. So it goes up a minor third. Similar thing where you go down to D flat seven, so E flat minor. Maybe E flat seven and two bars of D flat seven sharp eleven, and uh, that tempo's around where Joe Henderson does it. Um, the train version is real slow, ballad. Rosemary Clooney's a ballad. Uh, Mazikowski has a cool kind of. I feel like it's similar to the Joe Henderson tempo, but it's a nice kind of New Orleans uh, groove. I encourage you all to check it out. It's like uh, second line meets the Bill Evans trio, some of the stuff that Bill Huntington is doing. Um, kind of straight eights and swing at the same time. Anyway, I love it. It's one of my favorite records. But uh, Right, so that takes you up to the bridge, which I always think of as, uh, I mean, I learned this song pretty close to uh, where I, when I learned Cherokee. So I always feel like uh, invitation is like the minor key Cherokee bridge because you start off with D flat minor, F sharp seven to B flat minor, where Cherokee would be like. We'd go to B major, you know, so it's the same two five, but it goes minor. And I love the melody where you have. And I use that idea. Sometimes when I'm improvising, there was like a 2-5 idea. So you have D-flat, minor 9, and you got like a, what note is that? A-flat, like the 5th, and the natural 9, and then on the dominant chord, on the F-sharp 7, or G-flat 7, you just move those down a half step, and you get like G-natural and D-natural. That little figure moves down in, in half steps. Thing, B minor, E7, A minor. Then one more time to G minor. So D flat minor, F sharp 7, B minor, D minor, E7, A minor. A minor 7, D7, G minor. And then this. And here's where there's a little bit of variation on uh, different versions. Uh, I learned it as you have an E flat seven sharp eleven to like a D seven flat nine to G seven back to C minor and uh, Rosemary Clooney. I'll put it in uh, keep it in this key, although she's in the key of uh, E minor, so it's a little different. But they go uh, they do the E flat seven and then they do like a measure of A seven like the tritone sub, then the D seven and the G seven. And Coltrane does something like that too. Um, it's funny because it's so slow. I feel like he stays on the E flat seven for a long, longer time. Gives you the A seven right there, then D seven, G seven, C minor. So, uh, so rather than the Clooney one, it would be like E flat seven for a bar, A seven for a bar. D7 for a bar, G7 for a bar. Train gives you like E flat 7 for a bar, for another bar, and A7, two beats of D7, two beats of G7, C minor. Although it's from those old records, uh, Prestige, yo, I often feel like not everybody got the memo on what the chord changes were. <laughs> and I'm sure they, you know, they ran through those things, they didn't really rehearse. And uh, so that's kind of, that's what it sounds like the, they're playing on the, uh, on the head. Although I'm not sure if, uh, I guess, is that Red Garland? It was Paul Chambers. He plays some really cool, like, uh, ideas, rhythmic ideas on the, on the head, too, like a very sort of melodic bass line. It's worth checking out. Um, let's see, Mezikowski does the, does that, you know. Joe 
Henderson, he, he changes it up a little bit, just in the sense that it's a, he makes it a uh, E flat major seven, major seven sharp eleven rather than a dominant, but which really sounded kind of jumped out at me. I hadn't listened to that version in a while, but you have and Don Friedman on piano, D seven G seven C minor. Then the last sort of A is interesting because it has a cool little coda. Um, starts off the same. What most people do is they go to B7 sharp 11, then an F7, or an F minor, F minor 7 flat 5. People do different things there. B flat 7 to E flat minor major 7, and then D7, G7, C minor. So it's cool, it kind of resolves in E flat minor, although, you know, the tune's sort of in C minor. Um, interesting kind of uh, relationship there because I guess E flat major and C minor are pretty closely related right or very closely related relative major and minor and so somehow just making the uh, resolving an E flat minor instead of major has a kind of mysterious vibe to it but so that last section I guess I always think of this as uh, kind of like a bridge sort of like ABC form um, it's interesting. I guess I should have counted the bars. <laughs> I didn't really count them. I guess it's 16, or you know, you get 8 in the C minor, and then 8 in the E flat minor, then the bridge, and then this last bit. 4, you get 8 bars again. B flat 7. And Joe Henderson changes it up there, so he goes, uh, I, I wasn't aware of this until just a little while ago when I went back and, and checked this version, I hadn't heard it in a long time, but he did, in the last A, oops, I'm having my, uh, forgot to mute my, my thing over there, it's, uh, you know, these, these videos are really live, you guys, you know, things happen, weird little, little noises, I forget how many bars the songs are. Um, where was I? I was talking about Joe Henderson, yeah, the way he does that last part, he does the... minor and he doesn't do the B7 he just stays on E flat minor still E flat minor the F minor 7 flat 5 or F7 altered the B flat 7 and then he plays E flat major at the end which is kind of interesting and then turns around back to uh, C minor I'm not sure why uh, again I didn't listen to every version uh, because there's so many, I don't think I'd even capable of listening to every version of this tune. But I'm not sure where that came from. I think he maybe just came up with it on his own. And the Bill Evans version, it sounds like there's like they stretch out that last part a bit, a little bit longer, maybe uh, a little longer on those last two five chords in E flat minor. Again, you know, you can each one of these tunes you can really spend uh, forever on you know it's so there's so many versions and so many slight variations naturally when people make a record of the song they want to add their little their little thing to it but i like the mezkowski version because he just sort of it's a rhythmic it, it's the new orleans modern jazz vibe with all the the uh, groove things that you would imagine but it's very subtle and it's still real modern jazz and you know playing on the tune you could kind of go dorian c dorian flat seven you could kind of think it up think of it too I think you could play F minor then a B flat seven to E flat minor you kind of kind of make it a two five I mean the B flat seven is kind of could be uh, B flat seven sharp eleven you could go like Lydian dominant you could play F melodic minor I think might sound cool into E flat minor or you could like probably alter it Although I would wait, that's one of those chords where 
there's two B, two bars on the B flat seven, right? Theoretically, unless you want to make the first bar be like F minor and then B flat seven. But if I'm going to go B flat seven the whole time, I probably wouldn't fully alter it in the sense of I wouldn't play uh, flat thirteens and put all that gnarliness on it until like the last second before it went to E flat minor because I kind of feel like that G natural is important because it's the melody so if I'm going so I'm in C minor so this is like the, the A section so one two three four Like uh, I talk about in personalizing jazz vocabulary, having those uh, five eighth note resolution cells, and not uh, which you can do a number of different ways. I can do a tritone sub. That was kind of a uh, I guess that's super Locrian, or uh, there's a lot of ways to think about it. On B flat seven, those notes three and four and one, which is the resolution. It's kind of a B flat augmented triad. So minor up a half step from the B flat seven. A lot of different ways to think about it, but I'm waiting for those last uh, two beats before I really alter the chord and get away from this sound, which is so kind of nice. And that's the uh, maybe the common tone that gets you from C minor, B flat seven, and then it goes to E flat minor, that G natural. And then a similar thing going to the bridge, although D flat seven, it's not a two five one. It's going from D flat seven to D flat minor. So I wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't do a similar thing. I wouldn't put a, a flat thirteen sharp five on that D flat seven necessarily. I usually leave that for, uh, or even or a tritone sub. I might put. A I usually leave the flat 13 for a win. Uh, again, every time I say make these statements, and then I'm back in my mind, I'm thinking of times when I, I would put it on there in other contexts. But <laughs> usually, unless it's going 5 1, that's kind of when I put the flat 13. So D flat 7 go to D flat minor, not so much. But so the bridge, just 2 5. Although they're not, they're not, it's not uh, D flat minor 7 flat 5. It's very much like D flat minor 9 to F sharp 7, altered with the uh, flat 13 to B minor 9. So that's kind of an interesting progression. Whoops. for uh, Lydian dominant B flat melodic minor. If you want to think of it as a uh, seven note scale, I mean, I guess you could also do play off of that upper structure, you know, of sort of an A augmented triad. D flat seven. D flat seven flat nine, or you could probably play D minor seven flat five, G seven C minor, like when you're blowing on the tune there. Um, in those contexts, I don't need to necessarily. Although I could do D seven, I could be some kind of D seven with some some funk on it. <laughs> maybe uh, D half hole diminished. Maybe like a D triad to an A flat triad and a G seven to a D flat seven triad to C minor. That'd be a cool resolution. And then, you know, same deal for the first bit. And then you get to E flat minor. Then B7. And it's almost like you're going E flat minor, E flat Dorian, to E flat minor 7 flat 5, right? Because B7 sharp 11 from the third is E flat minor 7 flat 5. It's always good to think about the upper structure and think about the chords, at least from the third. I 
kind of like to let it let it hang on E flat minor for a second before going G7 back to C. I feel like that's such a cool, uh, interesting uh, modulation there. And yeah, I've never played on it with the Joe Henderson chords of going to E flat major at the end. Um, that would be strange. <laughs> I've just spent so many years doing it uh, this way. One other thing before I, I play some choruses on the song. Uh, chord voicing wise, there's a cool thing that I learned watching Steve Mazikowski play this. And I sort of learned all my chord voicings from, well, from watching him and watching other people play. I was never as systematic as uh, some folks. And some of my students here, you know, they, they use the drop system and they get, they get deep into it. And I'm always, I'm very impressed and very blown away. But I sort of reached the point where uh, I kind of do chords my own way. Um, I do some real sort of straight ones, you know, if I'm playing F7. Mm -hmm. A lot of the time I'll just do that, but what Steve does there that's kind of interesting, if I remember correctly, on the last part of the song, there's the B7 and then he would go, uh, so these voicings on the uh, middle three strings there, so for the F7, you're playing like, actually you're, you're basically playing this, F13, but putting those three notes on this middle set of strings, and then for the B, B flat 7, you're basically playing just like a sharp 9, but just playing it on those middle strings, sounds kind of cool. Especially this one, you kind of you get this separation between the chord and the melody note where it almost sounds like kind of a keyboard. kind of cool. I mean, it looks cool the other way too, but it's cool to have those higher notes, uh, that separation between the chord and the melody note on top. I mean, I think it's kind of like a Lenny Bro type idea. Although Jim Hall would, would play these chords a lot too, you know, quartal voicings, voicings in fourths, and then putting the, uh, having the third or the seventh in the bass as the lowest note. So it's F7, right? F13, with it's got the seven in the bass, E flat. Flat seven sharp nine with the third in the bass, the D in the bass, and then E flat minor uh, minor nine with the uh, six nine, I guess, with the uh, third in the bass. So it's G flat. And then you could go right. You're here. That could still be D seven. You could keep the keep the upper structure as a D seven sharp nine. G7 to C minor. So those little figures. how I, I use those voicings a lot to uh, comp for myself, like in a trio context, just trying to mimic the uh, stuff on that Live at Snug Harbor record, which you all should check out. So anyway, I want to play a few uh, choruses on this song, I explore some of these ideas, and uh, yeah, really cool, one of my favorite standards, interesting harmony, interesting form, and so many great uh, versions to check out. All right, enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you.